of all, let me thank everybody for being here. This is a uh, cause that's really important to me personally and important to the Northeast Ohio Medical University. What I'd like to do today is to connect some of the things that you're all talking about and asking about and showing what a medical university, an academic health science center, can do to be part of the solution here. And one of the things I'd encourage everyone to think through is how do you network in some of the people that you've been talking about who might be, quote, adversarial. Physicians, hospitals, medical schools, the former healthcare system, because frankly, I think you would find a lot of support if you base your discussion on those principles that we heard Ben talk about, on the belief that it is not equitable, just, fair, that just because of your income, your geography, or where you happen to be born, that you should live 10 years less than your neighbor 10 blocks away. That it should not be a matter of where you happen to reside about whether you have access to health care. That in the shadow of the Cleveland Clinic, of UH, of Mercy Health, these gigantic multi-billion dollar <coughs> systems that you can't get basic <laughs> primary care services. So we're going to talk today about what I like to see as a tale of two cities. What we're going to concentrate on today is a discussion around Akron and Cleveland. But having lived in Cincinnati, having regularly been available in, aha, great. I, I hate to be tied down. Having lived in Cincinnati, I've spent a lot of time in Columbus. What I'm going to talk about today is equally true in any city throughout Ohio. And if we look at the struggles of our rural communities, it's just as an important set of issues there as it is for our cities. So, a tale of two cities. It was the time, best of times, it was the worst of times. Probably some of you are old enough you had to recite this by memory, but I have to read it. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness, it was the epoch of belief, the winter of despair. We had everything before us, we had nothing before us, we are all going directly to heaven. We were all going directly the other way. In short, the period was so far like, I see that there's some form of title here, the present time as to be today. So the point here is that we really live at a time that is incredibly contrasting that in the shadows of our world-class health systems, that we are not getting the basic care delivered to large segments of the community. And that we need to connect the dots here. Connect the dots between having a world-class health system, yet having outcomes that are incredibly mediocre. And what we'll concentrate on what's happening here in Ohio, we can make this comparison across our whole nation, as you all well know, that maybe our healthcare system shouldn't be costing the most in the world, and yet not even yield the results of a developing country. And that it is unconscionable that we have health disparities that are driving the cost of care, if nothing more, forgetting about the human capital, the equity, the what's right principle, 
The economic principle here is that, as you've already discussed, money is being wasted on care that is delivered at the wrong place, the wrong time, and in the wrong way. So indeed, we do have substantial resources, but we are not using them wisely. And I'll finish up here talking about what a medical school should do. At Neomed, we believe that the medical school has a stewardship responsibility to the community that every member of the community should have health care. That it's not just an issue that's for the public good or an issue that's related to the health care of individuals and that right, but it's about economic viability of all the community. And when we don't serve a segment of the community, that we're actually costing the entire community, including those who happen to be wealthy, even more. So let me turn to just one example. And you could play this in any place in Ohio. We have the Cleveland Clinic. We have Mercy Health. We have SUMA. We have university, and it's already been noted in my little corner of the world in Green, Ohio, we have emergency rooms actually almost door to door. If I were a better baseball player, I could throw a hard ball from one to the other. And we all know that's a waste of resources, that competitive nature, and despite everybody's claiming that it improves health care, I believe there's really clear data that this drives up the cost of health care. But whether you believe that or not, we certainly know that things like, and this is in Summit County, Cuyahoga County, primary care access, happens to be above average, and these are comparisons within Ohio counties. Emergency room access, well, you could argue that uh, it's over accessible. You can hardly walk down the block without running into an emergency room in the more urban areas. Quaternary services, uh, you know, God forbid, you're badly ill with a uh, cancer that requires a transplant, you can get it there. We have a lot of choice. We have a wonderful children's hospital. We can talk about the ACO, or Accountable Care Organization, and what that's going to mean to the healthcare marketplace. Both Cleveland and Cincinnati were partners in Aligning Forces for Quality grants. These grants spurred citywide attempts to improve health care. For example, the care for people with diabetes or high blood pressure. And we had a CDC transformation grant that looked at bringing together health care in Akron and improving it through coordination. So there's some bright spots. But when you look at the actual outcomes, they're rather mediocre. When we look at the US, between 1900 and 2010, we've made some dramatic transitions, and I would say some important improvements. The causes of illness back at the turn of the century were things like pneumonia, tuberculosis, GI infections, things that people no longer are dying from. So over the long haul, we have certainly made impressive improvements. Now we could argue, is the improvements in quaternary care, the transplants, the ability to take a liver from one person and give it to somebody else, 
or is it in basic public health around sanitation? Is it around vaccination and improved primary care access? But clearly now our scourges are heart disease, cancer, we have problems, as you all know, with things like drug abuse, overdoses, accidents. But some of those other diseases are coming back because of our world. We have a real challenge uh, now, as uh, pointed out, uh, with the issue of we have a global society now. And Ebola was a incredible concern, as you all know, and uh, in one of our uh, communities in Northeast Ohio, there was a great concern that someone had been exposed and potentially was going to expose many others. So let's look for a moment about really what causes people's disability. And as you might expect, smoking, smoking, if you wrote down, is one of the root causes. And we'll talk a little bit about how we're doing. From there, high blood pressure, being overweight or obese, physical inactivity, and then things like high blood glucose, in other words, diabetes and alcohol use. <clears throat> the top 10 contributors to loss of quality life, though, look a little differently. So if you think about, you don't just want to be alive, you want to be able to do all the things you want to do, right? So while heart disease and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or emphysema, come up at the top, things like low back pain. How many would think that low back pain would be driving health care disability, and also health care costs? Things like major depression, so mental health, cause more disability than things we often think about, like stroke. Road traffic injuries and drug use, really high on the list of disability or loss of quality life years. So we're starting to think about health as being multidimensional. And it simply isn't the typical medical health that we talk about, but it's a combination of social, occupational, spiritual, physical, and of course the built environment itself is part of that. So what I'm going to do here is just highlight a little bit of the information. And if we were to look at Columbus, Portage County, where our medical school is located, Summit County and Cuyahoga County. And this is a rating, a composite score that looks at the health of each of Ohio's counties. And it goes from 1 to, I guess, uh, 88. Portage County, small rural county, up there, is uh, actually at the top 22 of those four counties. You notice here in a relatively rural area that the uh, health outcomes are actually worse. And in those areas that have the largest academic health centers, medical centers, they're actually not so good. So Hamilton County in Cincinnati, Cuyahoga County, Franklin County, there are none of them are real star performers. And if you start to think about it, we'll talk a little more, it's not because the care in Franklin County isn't necessarily good, or Cincinnati, or up in Cleveland. It's because there are other drivers of health that are well beyond health care system. So this county rankings, I think, is kind of interesting. 
and very sobering when you start to pin down in any given county what's going on. So here in uh, Summit County, up in uh, Akron area, 16.2% of high school students drink before age 13. And I'm not talking about the sacrament. I mean, there are 1.9 heroin overdoses each day. Each day. 19% of people are smoking still, which is above the national average. STDs, sexually transmitted diseases, continue to increase. A quarter of pregnant women are not getting treated in the first trimester, which we know is critical. Violent crime, obesity, alcohol use, remember all those real causes of disability are on the uptake. And in fact, I hate to say it, but Summit County is 175th <coughs> out of 190 communities with regard to healthy behaviors. So we've got a lot of work to do, and it's not simply about the health care system. It's about what drives health. And what drives health and what drives health disparities is as much the underlying economic, education, environment, and what we'll call social determinants of health. So infant mortality. We're going to talk about health disparities. So Caucasian 6.37, which is deaths per thousand high live births, and in the black African American community, 10.84. There are very high rates of prematurity, low and very low birth weight. And this, again, refers to Summit County. If you look at diabetes care, if you're Hispanic or African American, your diabetes care, and this is from data from the Better Health Partnership in Cleveland, is worse than that if you're a white individual. And I think probably it's easiest to see this most graphically. And for those of you who are not familiar with Summit County, this is the central Akron area, the poorest area of the community. It's the area where we have most racial and ethnic diversity. And it's the area where we have the least positive health outcomes and health behavior. So here's percent of prostate cancers diagnosed in a late stage. And you see again this sort of central area. You see here, up on the top, the percent of colorectal cancers, bowel cancers, that are diagnosed in late stage. So there's health disparities about cancer. Race drives the outcomes for marijuana use, for prescription drug abuse, and for alcohol use. So underlying many of the challenges that we face, and it's not a matter of people who happen to be of a certain type or live in a certain area are not attentive to their health or not doing the sorts of things that they should do. But it's a matter of our having to look at the bigger picture of what's driving these behaviors, as well as the outcomes, and therefore the costs of health care in these areas. So here's years of potential lost life. So if you cluster everything together, and start to think about what drives years that instead of living to be 79, you live to 69. Again, central Akron shows up again and again. And it doesn't matter what health outcome, what positive health outcome you look at. So we need to go below. 
We need to understand what are those drivers. And this is where the role of social determinants of health come in. How many are you familiar with that uh, terminology? So I, I see a number of you. This is defined as conditions in which people are born, they grow, they live, they work, and age. Their circumstances are shaped by what? By the things you've all been talking about, by power, wealth, resources at a global, national, and local level, which are influenced by policy choices, right? This is what this movement is about. And they're mostly responsible for the social and health inequities that we see, the unfair and avoidable differences in health. Flint, Michigan. Flint, Michigan, absolutely. And so to make this even perhaps more practical, if I'm a doctor and working on a traditional medical model, I tell you, you know, look, you gotta eat, you gotta eat better. I mean, you know, you're eating too much. Uh, you need to get some exercise. I want you to walk and uh, go to the gym. Or I may say, take this pill, okay? I'd like to have you really lose weight and this will help you. Or maybe, I might even say, gosh, you really have such a serious problem. I need you to consider bariatric surgery, weight reduction surgery. So that's a medical model. That would be the traditional way we might approach it. But a social determinant's look might be as follows. You're living in poverty in a very unsafe part of town. You work two jobs. The place where you live is food insecure. It's a food desert. You can't get the sort of things that I've asked you to eat, and you don't have the means to go to the places that are available. And you run into McDonald's between your two jobs to get your sustenance. Of course, it's not safe to walk outside because the gangs are out, and after you get off your two jobs, maybe at 10 o'clock at night, no one in the right mind is on the streets, and you can't go to the mall because of the transportation that you lack. Maybe you're on Obamacare, and you pay out of pocket for all your prescriptions, and who can afford the prices and maybe you just don't believe that surgery is appropriate. We know what influences health, and it's about 5% related to health care. And the US is the last country in the world to try to figure this out, the least of countries that has the means to actually do something about the drivers, which are physical environment, maybe about 10%, social and economic factors, which are around 40%, clinical care here, 20%, some say a lot less, and health behaviors, 30%. Looked at another way, socioeconomic factors are really the framework, the lens, through which health proceeds. So if you look again at Summit County, and I suspect for many of you it looked very much similar, one third of Summit County residents live in a food desert, and one in seven report food insecurity. 63% of African Americans are overweight, and 40% reported diabetes. <clears throat> Heart disease and stroke accounted for 37% of all deaths. If you look at the rates at which heart disease and stroke, in other words, the underlying factors are controlled, high blood pressure, <clears throat> cholesterol, weight, among others, you would see a great disparity between African Americans 
to what the Caucasian population is achieving. And what is driving this? Income inequality, educational inequality. For here in central Akron, there was a poverty rate of 50.9%. Over half of the people in central Akron. Overall Summit County rate was 15.3%, but in the African American population, the poverty rate is 31%. 41% of female head of households were in poverty. And child poverty was at a rate of 21.9%, versus the best county in the US at 13%. Educational attainment. 37.8% have at least two year degree or higher, whereas nationally it's 57% on average. These drivers shape the health outcomes. And again, if you look at uh, percent of people over 25 without a high school diploma, Central Akron lights up. You look at estimated percentage of persons without medical insurance, Central Akron lights up, and it's probably no surprise. So what can a community do that goes beyond health care? A group of us from Akron area went to Cuba. We went to Cuba to learn about health care, which is, uh, at first, might sound a little bit ridiculous. When we're right in the shadow of University Hospital, the Cleveland Clinic, uh, after all, you can be the uh, Shaw of Iran or something, and you'll fly to the Cleveland Clinic to get your care. But we had to go to Cuba to see a healthcare system, at least in the urban areas, that is accountable to the population and built on primary care where a nurse and a physician have a population that is defined by a geography that is about a block large, and where everybody is known to that group. There isn't a matter of you're coming in. It's a matter of if I need to look at your record of getting your mammogram and you haven't come in and you're due, I'm going to grab you and take you in. If you need your colonoscopy, I'm going to come up to you and say, hey, Kurt, uh, good to see you. Let's, let's go in and get your colonoscopy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So these are the sorts of things that we tried to bring in. And the term that they like to use is called health in all policies. So in making sure that health, now notice I didn't say health care. I said health. And again, if you're believing and following what I'm trying to trace here, it's a matter of having the actual top of the pyramid not drive the whole system. So we're going from an accountable care organization, say where the SUMA health care system, or Mount Carmel, or Perhaps down in Cincinnati, it's the University Hospital of Tri-Health. We're going from a, or a belief that all the care should be within that system to think of how does a county or a region become accountable for the care of everybody and not just those that happen to come into the system? How does a community take an approach that integrates this social determinants perspective. <coughs> and until we get something like single payer or universal health care, how do we go beyond just the health care, but look at the other factors which derive health? And there have been a whole number of efforts that I won't belabor. But you can look at the Summit County Community Health Improvement Plan is just one example of what we're trying to do to not look 
only it helped here, but it helped. Now there's a lot of things that are barriers currently, not the least of which is the way our healthcare system is fragmented and perhaps no system at all. The funding, the lack of a public voice, which is where you all can come in, coordination and goal setting, organizations, all well-meaning, but that are fragmented and not brought together. The ability to have data transportability so that if you're getting your care in one agency and we go to another, that that information is available. And our concerns about privacy, which are real. And when we set these priorities, they were things like transportation, housing, parks and green space, freedom from violence, educational attainment, and personal connection and community. These were the themes that came from focus groups and surveys and working together and taking the perspective of communities we're serving. It wasn't about how do I get the best health care in the world when I'm god awful sick, which, you know, I don't want to diminish. I think that's really great. But we need to believe that some of these other basic issues are not getting taken care of and that they drive health in a much more discernible way. So if you look at this, what causes disease at the end or drives disease and risk? Well, there's risky behaviors. It's driving under the influence. It's uh, becoming overweight. But these are actually driven by living conditions that reflect institutional power. Again, that power word. That are reflecting social inequity. So if you're going to be able to take one part of this, which is health care, think about what also is upstream that's driving health. The basic inequities, the basic disparities in life in the US. And start thinking how we as community members can all gather together, whether we're in public health, or community development, or you're an educator or an activist, that this is not going to be for the faint-hearted. This isn't a easy fix. This is not something that's going to be accomplished overnight. And just to think about, can we have an influence as a community? And what you see is a map here of the US and this reflects a study that was reported about in the Journal of the American Medical Association, reported in the New York Times. And it said if you're impoverished, if you're below the poverty level, what influence does where you live have? And through some very elegant research, we're able to show that where you live does matter. And the health policies of communities matter. And that in places like New York City, which you might think, oh my god, to be poor in New York, you're probably in uh, SOL. Actually, it turns out you do pretty well with regard to health outcomes and health. Because there is a community-wide approach to do that. So the best and worst places for the poor, New York City had the longest life for poor men. But at the shortest life for poor men was Gary, Indiana. Detroit, perhaps no surprise. Tulsa, Oklahoma. And likewise for women, Longest, New York City, Miami, Santa Barbara, and shortest, Las Vegas, Oklahoma City, Tulsa, Honolulu, Detroit. And if you were going to look at this even within cities or regions, there are places that you do real well because there are policies 
that reflect that we're a community by taking care of those who are the poorest and most in need, whether it be those with disabilities, those who have problems that are healthcare related, or those that don't. So what can a medical school do? What can a healthcare organization do? And this is where I want to try to draw the connection that you know, this isn't a we they thing. This isn't doctors versus the public. It isn't medical schools. It isn't even big pharma, although I'm no fan of big pharma. I'd love to give talks about that. If we're going to find a solution, it's in coming together and finding the rhetoric and establishing the network, to use the terms of then, and moving from an old model where instead of sickness being what we're trying to take care of, of promoting wellness, of looking at any price we're going to take care of people to one that delivers value. What's the improvement in health per unit cost. It's instead of just looking who comes to the hospital, to look at that denominator. Using that uh, Cuban model of making sure everybody gets cared for when they need it and before they have catastrophic consequences. It's going from balkanized to holistic. The physician is the captain sort of being the center to teamwork. It's going from being independent to accountable for the results so that we can expect that hospitals, that healthcare facilities, and even, yes, physicians should have data that demonstrate what percentage of the people who I care for actually have their diabetes taken care of appropriately. When we did this in Cincinnati and looked at, when we started, the five things that drive diabetes outcomes that every physician and healthcare organization recommended would believe in, less than 5% of people have those five factors, like appropriate blood pressure, appropriate diabetes control, cholesterol, weight, stuff that's not hard in and of itself. But out in practice is really hard to do altogether optimally. It's starting to look at the pipeline. And this is where we're really happy to think about how do we get individuals from the community that reflect the whole community, not just those that have privilege, train in the community and go back to serve those communities, particularly those that are underserved. The Education for Service program is to address the needs for health by taking physicians, nurses, pharmacists, and other healthcare practitioners and put them in rural and urban underserved communities to increase the number from that pipeline that come from those communities because we know by training in the community and getting folks from the community, we're better able to impact those health disparities and improve health outcomes. And if we just simply wait, which has been the policy at least for many years, to who happens to come to our doorstep at the time of admissions, we're never going to have an influence on our healthcare workforce because to compete in medical school admissions, you've got to have that preparation that begins 10, 15 years before. So we have to get upstream. We have to talk about that pipeline. And we need to develop new healthcare partnerships that we're not going to be able to go this alone. We have an academic campus in Cleveland. And in that program, in this new healthcare training endeavor, we're taking kids from underserved communities, involving them in pipeline programs, things like our Health Professions Affinity Program, 
which is taking high school students and looking at health in their community and allowing them to develop interventions that are community responsive. So for example, it might be a walking program because people see an epidemic of obesity. If we're talking about teen pregnancy, it might be a community-wide effort to look at some of the underlying factors that are related to teen pregnancy. It's about getting foundations to support that effort. It's about clinical partnerships and trying to influence and bring people to the table who are competitors at one hand but all should be at the table to improve access and equity and reduce health disparities in the long run by promoting a healthcare workforce in primary care in a new model of care that can really address the issues. The picture of our Center for Innovation in the Health Professions is bringing nurses, physicians, social work, law, urban studies together. It's about what we teach and how we teach it. So for example, the emphasis on public health, population health, experiential learning. So the physicians in our program up in Cleveland are working in Huff. They're working in central Cleveland. They're not just simply working in the well-to-do suburbs. In our rural program, we're getting people out into rural communities to get their training, and not just simply train in the typical academic center. It's curricular enhancements. It's about creating a culture of health that's reflected in our own environment. And it's actually tracking outcomes and holding ourselves accountable for those outcomes. We were founded in 1973 to train physicians for the community, primarily family physicians. And we've taken that seriously. And that we need to create a primary care workforce that is equipped to handle the environments that they're going to serve in, that looks like the populations they're going to serve, and that has a social responsibility to those communities. And that while their primary aim is in health care, that they have to be concerned about health. So I think we have a few moments for questions and comments or thoughts about how we might work together. I'll put up the lights. Okay, I see uh, some hands up and I'll try to pick you. I don't know how we do this, but I'll just give you these uh, wonderful uh, microphones. Yeah. I'm Marilyn Webster from Columbus area, and I'm a registered nurse. But I think that the biggest problem with primary care physicians is that the cost of med school is so high that a lot of them go on and specialize in things, and so that lessens the number of just primary care physicians. So the comment uh, is around uh, the uh, cost uh, of uh, obtaining a degree. Our average uh, person in uh, Neomed has a debt of 154000 Now, that sounds like a lot, and it is, but you have to look at the average income of a physician once they're out. And frankly, if your average income is 200000 for a primary care family doc, 
And there are many programs in which you can get your entire education paid for, including Ohio First, all the many foundation service learning scholarships where, for example, Mercy Health has provided $3 million of scholarship funding. And that's in return, that loan would be forgiven if you serve in any of their facilities, in any specialty. So I don't see too many physicians who are starving. I don't see too many pediatricians, family physicians, or general internists who can't make an honest living. But you're right. Until we narrow that income differential substantially, it has no basis in any policy that's rational. What we've allowed is a marketplace to determine what we should be determining at a policy level. OK, I've got some questions over here, and then I'll go to the okay, other we'll side of the room. One here and there, and then it's almost lunchtime. OK, so we don't want to get in the way of lunch. No, no. <laughs> I'm Lou Klein. I'm a physician specializing in psychiatry. One thing in my specialty, but I think others too, is the patient does play a role in all this. The patient isn't just a victim. So the patient not only needs to be educated, but as a psychiatrist, I see people who are depressed and sometimes don't care to do their part to improve things like uh, diet, etc. So it's a challenge, but it is fixable to not only educate, first you have to motivate to want to do it, but if the patient plays a role, you're more likely to have a success than we do it for them. And the same might be said for communities. Uh, you know, we often take this uh, sort of high and mighty approach, and frankly, uh, it has to be part of the solution. So, uh, one more question? Yeah, and that what you're talking about is participation. That we should be able to participate in our healthcare system, which is one of the principles or characteristics of a healthcare system that meets human rights standards. Absolutely. So participation, engagement is absolutely. Last question? I think I'm happy to comment. Uh, that what you're doing in your conclusions, I'm totally in agreement with. Um, but underlying, when you look at income and health, it, from an economist perspective, there's, there's two things that always get me that I want to ask a question about. It. If you ask an economist, he'll tell you bad health causes low income. And you ask the doctor, and he says low income causes bad health, and we never get a conclusion to this. But the other thing is, is that in those regional information that you get, there's a lot of out migration from those poor health areas. And when you go to the, to the local people, they're saying, how do we get healthy and educated people to stay in these communities? And it comes around. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, uh, you know, it's like any problem that's worth solving is a lot more complex than you would initially hope it to be. So the bi-directional relationship of health, income, and you could also add education in there, is extremely complicated. And the associations that those maps show are only the first layer of the onion. The idea that our inner cities are associated with poor health belies what's happening in individual zip codes, what's happening on a micro level. But my thesis is, until we believe as a country that the health of every citizen the living circumstances of every citizen. But those of us who happen to be, by whether it's nature or nurture, whether it's because unearned we were born privilege. to a certain area. Unearned privilege. Unearned privilege. Thank you. However we want to frame this, that it's our responsibility to be part of a solution. Whether we're a physician or an economist, a housewife, whether we live in suburbia or we live in the inner city, whether we're black or white, until we decide that there's a common set of goals that we have for our communities, 
I believe we will still underperform. So let me stop there and thank you all for your one, one careful more, time. Oh, one more question? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> I'm, I'm a retired physician professor in medical school. Uh, I just wanted to first of all agree with the nurse over there. Uh, when I went to medical school, I had $400, I had $400 a year in your life insurance. Both my parents were dead. When I graduated from Richard Rochester, I owed $5,000. Uh, that's, you could inflate that uh, quite a bit, but it doesn't come close to owing $154,000 a day. And I, I think the, what I, the changes I see in physicians, or I, I saw in medical students, in case was a very report about your retired, was a transition from kids that really had humanistic interest, interest much in the kind of things you talked about earlier, to physicians who've been put into a kind of sociological environment in which money is overwhelmingly important. <coughs> well, I see medical students who have a very idealistically, but by the time they finish, if that was dead, they're willing to be complicit with whatever happened to get along with or beyond that. Yeah, we got two organizations that you kept mentioning as the shadows of the you know, hospital yeah. and speaking yeah. thing, which I think are deplorable. Uh, if you look at the rate of two results of development when I was in medical school, it was under one percent. I had a person head of monitoring that at the Cleveland Clinic nationally. Who was so proud that we only had 5.9% of people who get the two results of post surgery. With decent nursing care, it ought to be very close to zero. Uh, if you look at the autopsy rate, we were talking medical school and doctors cared and really wanted to know and had a good relationship with the family that they could get autopsies and find out. The autopsy rate in good places then was around 80%. Neither the Cleveland Clinic nor University Hospital has even 20% of autopsies. I could go on, but I think your theme is absolutely right. But I think the, the other huge problem is the complicity of administrators and, and the medical community in allowing this sort of thing to continue. Well, I wouldn't argue except to say that it's our policy decisions. Our policy around how we reimburse for health care and for doing stuff as opposed to looking at health that drive a lot of the outcomes we get. As Paul Battalion said, a very famous uh, doctor still living and uh, working in quality improvement, every system is perfectly designed to get the results it achieves. <laughs> and our system is designed in this way, very purposefully, or, or perhaps not, but we're getting the results that the system is designed to achieve first. Unfortunately, I think that really is not the best we can do, nor is it what our communities deserve. Let me stop there. Thank you all very much. Thank you.